Cheers. Cheers. Welcome, Welcome to, to Movie, movie Bitches. bitches. Uh, <laughs> Retro Review episode 44. So we have a very special virtual guest. We have James Mansfield, our favorite old movie buddy. Friend of the channel. I don't know what you're talking about. I am right here inside of the Movie Bitches studio. <laughs> Tonight we have James joining us to review Torch Song Trilogy. Torch Song Trilogy. That makes it sound more like it's like a Star Wars movie and less like a gay, you know, tragic three-part drama i mean essentially the play was three parts and it's a trilogy isn't that how math works yes that is. yeah and shockingly enough this this film wasn't six hours like the play was so mm. i know they had to really oh trim God. it down those time jumps really got i was like what it's been three years yeah right they <laughs> moved it along isn't it impressive how Harvey Firestein looks like in his mid forties from his youth all the way to his forties in this film? I've never seen him this young and he still looks the same. That mini, that miniature. My God. His Disney eyes, his like expressive I was just mesmerized. <gasps> so yes, Torch Song Trilogy is the like semi-autobiographical story of Harvey Firestein's life. And it started on Broadway. Well, it started off Broadway. Then it started on Broadway, and then they made it into a movie years later. But it's not available much of anywhere, so you'll have to find it. I'll do my best Lucille Bluth. <laughs> and please watch this movie, because I think it's wonderful and so important and amazing. Yeah. Bear in mind, when I recommended this film, I was pretty certain it was still on Netflix, and then they yanked it off, so I'm sorry about that. Uh... I mean, you never know. They, they come in waves. So someone could be seeing this and it is streaming somewhere. That's true. This lives on forever. It's on the internet. Exactly. But also, and if not, we... just watch our version. It's better. Okay. Exactly. But also we did a viewing party, except I had some technical difficulties. So Avril did a viewing party. and It's just uh, me watching the movie alone with my dog. So it's riveting. <laughs> I also may or may oh. not be eating chips. Avril, I am so curious right now. Um, where is Cousin Stu? <laughs> He's here. Ah. Where have you been hiding him all this time? He lives in Australia. Well, is but he, he's... Where is he now? Is, is he nearby? <laughs> Should I text him? Is he like blood relative? Is, is, is there or like a weird clueless thing happening? I, I have so many questions. <laughs> There's no weird clueless thing happening. That was weird, yeah. <laughs> I do like how they kind of shoehorn that into the movie, though, where she's like, Josh, we're like hardly even related. Like, that was from they a different parent. They have to make parent. it clear. Yeah. They we're weren't like, related. they didn't grow up as, as children, children. <laughs> Our children will be fine. We'll, they'll be fine. There's no tutor situation happening here. Exactly. <laughs> so, James, when did you first see this movie? I saw this movie in high school. Um, I was around all the old gays and they kept recommending this film to me. I was like, oh, fine. I finally bit the bullet and watched it. And girl, it was life affirming for me. <laughs> um, I have to say um, the Harvey Firestein drag thing, I never really knew was actually a thing. Like you at that him? point in my, I never knew he was a drag queen. Oh. When I was a teenager, I didn't know. I just thought he was like the weird guy from Independence Day. And Mrs. Doubtfire. And Mrs. Doubtfire. Of course. <laughs> It's strange how his later Hollywood career got very less gay and very less drag. It is weird. Watching this, I was like surprised that he didn't go on to do way more acting because he was fabulous. Like in movies, obviously he like was on Broadway for a while. Right. The biggest thing he did was the Mulan thing. Sure. Oh, and I guess the... that. <laughs> oh no, he did Hairspray on Broadway. I keep doing mm -hmm. all the Broadway stuff. In oh, right, because John Travolta? Yeah. Yeah. That's still the most terrifying reveal I've ever seen. <laughs> the, the spin around. He got to re reprise the role in the like you know TV version of it, which was not bad. It w was not bad. There's a TV version of Hairspray. Yes, they did a live production of it. Oh, oh, oh right. like Legally Blonde or whatever, like how they did that. And, like they did Grease and everything, right. and they've been really bad. Hairspray was not bad. It was pretty good. Oh, okay. Speaking of six-hour-long musicals. Or not musicals, Broadway shows. It was just a Broadway show. This is kind of like what I think Inheritance Play, which I don't know, James, if you're familiar. I am not. not. Okay. You're not either, Avril? Should I be? I thought I talked to you about it. 
So there's oh. a play called Inheritance, and it's this overwrought two part. Each part is four and a half hours long. Gays, like, and older gays, and like, you know, it's sort of this, but modern, but much worse. And I found that this movie really handled tone well, and I thought that it was so well written in terms of like the drama felt real and personal. Yes. We were saying, like, I, I kind of felt like Aja and the Queen was trying to pull some of the drama that this does with oh, AJ a- and the AJ. Queen. AJ, AJ and the Queen. <laughs> I wish it was Aja and the Queen. That would have been great. Much more fun. Although yes. we still love your part in it. Oh my God. Oh, thank you. He took Still my the whole show. <laughs> hey, that kid took my spare boobs. Andrew, what was your opinion on this film? Just curious. I always like to know. Every time I show this movie to a, a person of a younger persuasion in the LGBT community, there's always one of two ways they go where it's either they really, really liked it or they found it very melodramatic and dated, which is essentially what they thought about it when it was a release. They thought it was just too melodramatic. Like, there's a lot of controversy that went in and surrounded this film during its release and production, but we'll get into that, I imagine. Yeah, we will. We, so I had never seen it until last night, and I didn't really find it that melodramatic. I really liked it. I thought it was maybe not outdated at all in, in, in far too many upsetting ways, you know, where you're just like, oh, shit, this still happens. I don't think it was outdated either, but it, it definitely feels like a play at times. Oh, yes. And that's sort of where it's, it could feel semi-dated, you know, kind of thing. And it does look very glossy. So I think that might be what people are interpreting. But I feel like it was very relevant and still very personal. I mean, there was times when Anne Bancroft and Harvey Firestein were, <laughs> when they were yelling at each other in the cemetery, I was like, <sighs> gleefully just like, this is drama. Hi, drama. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm doing the same thing you're doing. No, I'm reciting Kaddish for my husband. You're blaspheming your religion. Mommy, you know who this is? This is my lover. But then she would throw out this like, well, I wish that I never had you then if I knew you were going to come out gay. And you're just like, ugh. You know, so it, it's like high drama. And then there's a line that's just so real and you know has been said. And you're like, well, fuck, maybe this isn't that melodramatic. Yeah, and it's different because I always view it more of like a time capsule kind of movie. Like it does definitely capsulize a period in time that is not existent anymore in the gay world or LGBT community. And especially it was the first movie that said those things. Other than Boys in the Band, this is the first big glossy Hollywood film that they yeah. took a risk on. So there's a lot to be said for that. Absolutely. Oh, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our stage, Birth of a Nation! Yay! Can we talk about Birth of a Nation? Can we talk about Charles Pierce? Yes, please. Personally, I never enjoy sex with someone I know. Our lady of high standards. Cat, not girls. He was my oh. favorite. Oh, he was so amazing. His eyes, everything he was doing in and out of drag, I was just captivated. Yeah. If you read, write that down, Charles Pierce's assistant wrote a book about him and basically <gasps> spilled a lot of tea. It's brilliant. And it has all of his old jokes in it. It's amazing. But like, he was talking about how the, filming this movie there was a little bit of tension between him and Harvey because basically Charles was claiming Harvey thought Charles Pierce was stealing the scenes. Like basically well, eating the scenery. <laughs> I mean. Oh, 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 the last time I saw a basket like that was around Red Riding Hood's arm. Oh. He's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> to me, also like Harvey Firestein's drag is very, very drab in this movie in comparison oh. to everyone else. Oh my God. Yeah. Every time he sings. I belong to a lonesome cop. I... Oh, I just cackled with glee. I loved it so much. So, so much. Charles Pierce's character was added for the movie specifically, right? Yeah, she wasn't in the play. But no, she was claiming that that's what Harvey Firestein was doing this whole time. Like, he'd throw out funny lines and like the final cut he was not pleased with because he's, he's only in the movie for about three minutes. Just give me my Christmas balls. Oh, rude. <laughs> You have a high voice for a lesbian. I mean, he's famous for doing Betty Davis and Tallulah Bankhead and Mae West and all of them. Oh. Spot on. You did, did, you did, did. So someone else is going to eat your Christmas pudding. Can we talk about the scene where we first meet Matthew Broderick? Because I have questions. Why was he hanging out with that blonde asshole? What was happening? 
I, they were models. They're just oh, sexy models. were they all the model crew? Is that what it was? Yeah, they're supposed to be like, you know, gay models that right. were like, I guess, print ad models or whatever, where they're all hanging out because they're gorgeous and gay. But the blonde guy was so aggressive and mean. I guess he was like having angry closeted issues or was he straight? And like out on the town and Matthew Roderick was like, let's go to this drag club. And then he was an asshole. I don't know. Bring on the freaks. Did your mother have any children that lived? <laughs> See, in my mind, I had this whole backstory because they're all in like tuxedos. Oh. Right? And yes. like who's going well, around like in tuxedos? New Year's? Christmas. Christmas. Oh my God, the little G-strings. Okay, that's all I'm oh saying. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> but so in my mind, I was like, ooh, maybe they were at like a wedding. Right. And then he's all gay, but he's trying to flirt with the other boys. And he's like, hey, we could go to the show down, down over here, downtown or whatever. And then brings them. But then they're schmucks and drunk and they're like heckling because he's a drunk straight bro. And he's like, no, man, I'm not gay. I'm not going to hook up. I don't know. I I was confused as to what was going on, but there was <laughs> no, something there. Remember later the, the champagne windblown Rolls Royce fantasy tuxedo photo shoot, which was everything. Remember he was in a tuxedo for that. So Again, I think it yeah. was just like work clothes. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's only in tuxedos for modeling. Yes, even though he looks 12. It, it's a stretch, but also like Matthew Broderick played the son in the play. Right, he, he was David. playing the boyfriend, yeah. They had cast, because it was this was right after the car accident where he killed that person in Ireland accidentally and so he didn't want to be in the movie and they cast Tate Donovan as Alan and then Ooh. Matthew Broderick was like oh no I'll be in it and they were like okay anyway never mind bye Tate, Tate Donovan oh, no. he was good his little twinkie Matthew Broderick I was kind of impressed he pulled the punches as far as it goes it's like the only Matthew Broderick references I have is Spin City and Back to the Future and those aren't necessarily the most that's, that that's show Michael J. Fox <laughs> oh shit <laughs> Matthew Broderick, Matthew Broderick. Uh, Bueller. Ferris. Bueller. Right, Ferris Bueller. Oh my God, that's embarrassing. And then. I'm supposed to tell these white people apart. <laughs> I mean, they are pretty similar typecast. They were going it's up for the like same parts. The, yeah. The dweeby kind of, you know, pretty boy, yeah. It's interesting that he, this is after Ferris, after Biloxi Blues, after War Games, like he was established and he still came back and did this. And I think that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. And married Sarah Jessica Parker. Wow. Oh, right. <laughs> I always forget about that. I do too. But in the middle of this movie, I was like, oh yeah, they're still married. Somehow, for some reason, when they were in the barn in the hay, I thought of it. I don't know why. Oh boy, that's what oh, you're Oh wait, I just realized scene. why. Oh, that's so oh, shady. Oh, Avril. Avril. Where's the shade button? <laughs> It just happened. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Like a motorcycle starting out. No, I liked it's it. Just I liked fruit. it. It's just grapefruit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ew. Ew. Not what I expected to come up during Torch Song Trilogy. <laughs> really? <laughs> Although there was a backroom scene in there. I was just going to say, I will appreciate that too. Like the fact that this movie was released theatrically had all of these gay references, showed all of these things, showed a backroom hookup scene in more detail than fucking, uh, what was the biopic on um, Queen? Elton John. Or Elton oh, John. sure. <laughs> Either of those. Bohemian Rhapsody or... Um, uh, gay and British. Yeah. Rock and <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There was someone that came out of the stud club that I was like, okay, Freddie Mercury cosplay. I see you. Or that one scene when they're on the town, like Harvey Firestein and I forget her name, the other drag queen that wasn't Charles Pierce. Oh, um, uh, Marsha Dimes? Marsha Dimes, yeah, they're out of drag and they're walking. Murray, that's it, Murray. Um, I thought it was so fascinating how they both like walk into a lesbian club and ran out laughing, because I guess that was the thing, the way it was back in the day where like they did not co-mingle. Yeah. The lesbians, lesbians did not. threw them the fuck out. <laughs> That was a weird scene, but I guess it was supposed to tell us a lot of, like, they only had so many... They had the one bar to go to. And it played Rod Stewart. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> always That's... weird. Always so weird. <laughs> James Brown and Rod Stewart. I was huh. like, okay, sure. You want to know a fun fact about Murray? Ken Page is the actor. He's the voice of Oogie Boogie from Nightmare Before Christmas. Weird. Holy IMDb, wow. Isn't that crazy? He was also the 
voice of the King Gator from um, All Dogs Go to Heaven. Slightly less exciting, but still exciting, nonetheless. <laughs> so speaking of the cast from the play to the movie, Estelle Getty was originally the mom. Oh. Sophia. Imagine what that would have been like. But that would have been nuts. Although, that I still thought that way. she was amazing. And at a oh. certain point, she's like storming out of his apartment in the morning. And, you know, angry, whatever, I'm leaving. And yet her hair is perfectly blown out. And I was just That's, so impressed. You know, it's just what she does. We go to Florida. It's what we do. Oh my God. It's what we do. We go to Florida. That's what we do. We go to Florida. My father died. My mother went to Florida. And our mother before that. That's what we do. We go to Florida. And Bancroft at that age was not appearing on screen without a perfectly cropped wig. Mm-hmm. It was wig. No, almost the giving me... This was like Turning Point and Bancroft. Have you seen the Turning Point? I haven't, no. Oh my God. It's talk about like overly dramatic. It's like a ballet movie with her and Shirley MacLaine. You got married because you knew you were second rate. And you got pregnant because Wayne was a ballet dancer in those days that meant queer. So you had to prove he was a man, so you had a baby. That's a goddamn lie. That's a goddamn truth. And it's pretty fab. You bitch. Ooh, are they like, is it like aging actress? Like, yes, are you talk about here? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> what about that great speech in the beginning? My favorite was when he's talking about, well, I couldn't be anything else but a drag queen because. Try as I may. I just can't walk in flats. <laughs> With a voice like this, I could always drive a cab. Oh my God. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, it was so good. What is shocking is like Harvey Firestein's a very beautiful drag queen. But in this movie, I guess him and the director were going back and forth about how Virginia Ham should look. And the director was dead set on her looking like, you know, an 18th century naked woman portrait. Like, <laughs> Why you think gorgeous, huh? Give me a break. It's still under construction. It, it's a bit startling. It, yeah. It's quite startling. <laughs> well, and we didn't talk about the, the torch song of it all, like what that means and how... I mean, it, the origin is that you're like carrying a torch for someone. That's the whole like, and it's unrequited, or it's you like them more than they like you, or you have basically you're you're singing the blues. You're sad about it. You're Julie London's of the world. <laughs> oh, oh my God, she is my favorite part of the girl can't help it. By the way. Yes, and they had Jane Mansell lip syncing to her as if we're supposed to believe Jane Mansell ever sounded like that. <laughs> <laughs> she shows up as like a. Radio ghost? I don't even know. She's like all like ghostly opaque and she's singing and it's, oh, it's good. <laughs> when he's doing his makeup at the beginning with the voice and the hair, it was really giving me um, Marge's sisters from The Simpsons, like Selma and Patty. <laughs> <laughs> you know the Heimlich maneuver? No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my life I've slept with more men than it named under a number in the Bible. I don't, oh, Andrew hasn't seen The Simpsons. Oh, really? Yeah. What? Oh my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> I really like that reaction. Were you kept in a cupboard growing up? What's I going know, on right? Here? Oh, and um, that Colleen Atwood did the costumes. Yes, I saw that. I was very excited when I saw that. They were good. The costumes. I was trying to think if there was anything that really stood out as like the most amazing. Well, I mean, Murray was wearing all the drapes from Tara on his oh, outfit. Yeah. Yes, they were. I mean, was, the gold fringe and the this and the that, it was a lot. It was good though, it was good. And she probably made those G-strings, so you know. Oh my God, can you imagine? Do you think? Oh, I really yeah. hope that's true. Of course. I just love that like, you know, Colleen Atwood designing this little button poof G-string. <laughs> yes. Put it on the resume. Yes. And his like Doctor Who scarf that he was wearing out on the streets. I mean, there was a lot of, Style going on. A lot of style. Although I have to say we do a lot with like the storyline here. Like I understand like it's a big, big story, but one thing about these Hollywood movies that never seems to fail is that there's never enough drag in it. I know. You can condense it down to eight minutes how much drag was in this film. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of crazy, particularly given that like I guess it's really supposed to just be more about his relationship with his mother and with men. And like the drag is back it's not even like a plot it's just kind of like oh and then you know which i kind of like though it's almost like that was his job like i mean it is his job but like 
Oh, and then he's a file clerk at the DMV or whatever, right? And it's like every now and then we have a shot of him at work, but it's pretty boring. I mean, the drag stuff wasn't boring, but it was small. It wasn't the headline. It was, oh, of course, and I'm a drag queen. Yeah, oh, and then he's a drag queen. So now we're seeing him at work, you know. Oh, my God, you came to my place of work? What are you doing here, Ed? You know? It's weird because it seemed almost like the filmmakers themselves, even like advertising this film was like not even trying to advertise that there was drag. And like, you look at the movie poster, it's all the men's suits lined up and then a pair of bunny slippers. It's like no high heels, nothing like to really signify, you know, big gay drag movie. Wait, but can we talk about the bunnies? Oh my God, the bunnies. <laughs> I feel like we need to talk about the bunny. I loved like, at a certain point, I just kept noticing little bunny things. It was like, oh, that's weird. All those bunnies on the top of the oh. ceiling. And then, oh wait, look more bunnies. And then I was like, oh my God, we should count all of the bunnies and make a drinking game of the bunny. And then it became like, they were like acknowledging it. Well, apparently Harvey Firestein likes bunnies and it was like he has his own collection of bunny things of course and they put it in the movie and i was like okay sure. i was reading into it i was like oh it's gonna be some alice in wonderland allegory okay i see you yeah oh no it's just that he likes bunnies okay yeah. great it's a sign of <laughs> you know fertility and and, and right. sex in the bedroom i don't know <laughs> paganism the bunnies you know, are all cute. Of it. <laughs> the bunnies are cute oh his bunny slippers when he goes to the principal's office oh my god I really liked the kid. Oh my god, yes. Except when he's in that gray suit and he looks like Pee Wee Herman. Oh my god. <laughs> it did not fit right. It was... Oh my god, but Anne Mancroft thinking he's trying to steal her suitcase. So just... Get away from me! Help! Mugger! Well, I'm not a mugger. You're Evan, you're a rapist. Get on! Why would a rapist wear a three suit? Ow! Ooh, how do I know? Maybe you got a wedding after. For those of you who would not get up and say, I'll offer me a seat, I thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, right? She's on the bus. <laughs> It was a pleasure meeting you all, not one of whom would give me a seat. Thanks to you gentlemen, I now have varicose veins. I have varicose veins thanks to you now, thank you. Yeah. That Anne Bancroft was a trip in this movie. Yes, <laughs> she really was. I, I loved her character for so much, and then for me, she basically was irredeemable by the end. For me, they show that there is hope. Baba! They wave at the end and the, he hugs the oranges. It was very the jerk. I don't need anything except for this hat and these oranges and these sunglasses and that's all that's all that I need. The ashtray, the power game, and the remote control, and that's all I need. I was confused by the end then, I guess. Because like to me it seemed like she was like, Oh, I can't handle this shit. Your son, you know, whatever like I'm out. I'm bye. Can't do this. We also waited to spring it on her he had one right then and there. <laughs> Yes. I think that there was a look between them that said, I can't deal with this maybe right now, but I'm, we're not going to never speak again. Like I saw that there was a light at the end of the tunnel. That's right. I got roughly the same kind of feeling after I watched this. Like what I liked about the ending is that they left it kind of open where they didn't wrap it up with a pretty bow. Cause that yeah. ain't how life is, honey. Like family is messy and Arnold's not innocent in all this either. Like, yeah, the mom was awful. But he also waited until that day to spring it on her if she had a family and a husband. Right, right. That his his lover, as they love to keep saying, my lover. Yeah. At this point during the soak, my lover and I usually crave spiced meat. Uh, mm. uh, um, was murdered in a hate crime. I mean, it was horrible. But like, yeah. oh, it was a car accident. Like, so yes, he is complicit as well. That's fair. And they got they let her have her say too, which she said something that really resonated, which was you know. She would have liked to at least been told or be included. He didn't include her in anything. That's true. That's yeah, she true. said we we could have shared our grief together. I, my, I maybe I could have helped you. You don't know. You didn't even try. So there's like I like it's it felt very real. Yes. It didn't feel Hollywood now, which would have been oh, and I accept you, and everything's perfect, and we're great. It would have been Hollywood credits the show where they're just like oh, there was no <laughs> struggle at all. Everything was great. I haven't watched it. I don't want to see Anne Bancroft get rammed on a staircase. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is that what ho the Hollywood is? I haven't watched it. Hollywood, it's basically it like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where it's like, let's reimagine history as if oh, okay. life in Hollywood, like the golden age of Hollywood. As if it was great. Wasn't homophobic and, and misogynistic and rapey. And instead, like, well, there's still lots of sex, but I guess more consensual-ish. There's more like... okay. Well, it doesn't seem that consensual in the sense that it's like very Me too e, but it's like, but it's Me Too with gays, so it's hot. I don't know. It, to me, it comes off weird, but I haven't watched the show. I've just seen the, the preview 
you know, so. It's a, a phrase... fairy tale. It's a fairy tale. Yes. <laughs> the, the phrase me too with gay, so it's hot, really, really got me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like weird where it's like, ooh, this cute young boy, but like he's going to make it to the top by sleeping his way to the top as a homosexual instead of repressing his sexuality. And you're like, but he's still getting sexually abused by the people in power at the top. I'll do anything. I am not just a star. I am a star maker. The series wasn't made for people like us because we know too much. Yes, We yes. ask too many questions. We're sitting there like, but what about that Hayes Co? What about the fact that it was illegal? Well, in that really matter of fact scene between on, I think it was Arnold and Alan's first date, Matthew Roderick and Harvey Firestein's first date, when he's just like, oh, I was like a male escort. Only the guy I met cared about was my price tag for the evening. I figured I needed the affection more than they needed the money. So I took it. It reminded me of, you've ever seen that film, Outrageous, with <gasps> yes! um, Craig Russell. That's on our Canadian list of film. stuff to watch, to retro review. It reminded me of that scene with, um, I believe his name was actually Arnold or something similar in that too. But um, he basically took home a hooker and the hooker told him like, I just thought you knew how things were. like, And it was very telling about how it was just something that happened. You asked, you, uh, people brought home escorts. They expected to pay for gay sex, and that was that what it was. Well, I thought that line, though, too, of like, oh, well, I needed the affection more than they needed the money. So I said, yeah. I figured, why not? What about that messy drama with Ed and his wife and the fact that she <gasps> insisted on meeting Arnold? What, what was, was that weekend? What was how that weekend? How did she think that was going to turn out? <laughs> Thank you. Also, how did, how did Arnold think that was going to turn out? Of like, oh, yeah, why don't you go to the barn? Uh, Ed, why don't you take Alan out and show it to him? He's the real can connoisseur in the family. I'll stay and help Laurel with the dishes. It was a test, Andrew. It was a test. And he failed, but then they stayed together. Yeah. I had already seen the movie, but I was still surprised when they fucked in the bar. And I was like, oh, I forgot this happened. Oh, because the reason that I have seen this movie, weirdly enough, I go on like weird IMDb tangents. So they were playing Torch Song on TCM, which is this Joan Crawford, not very good movie where she does blackface and it's a musical. And it's, yeah. it's like, whoa. And then... At the end of it, they were talking about Torch Song, and then they had mentioned Torch Song trilogy. I was Harvey Firestein in the movie. And so then that's how I discovered this movie. But yeah, Torch Song. Whoa. And spoil that line. <laughs> if you could get your right leg in a little bit, you could get and around. And spoil that line. Tell Mr. Ellis he's paid to get around that leg. And smile, or we get another boy. But wasn't her apartment in Torch Song, like, absolutely fabulous? I feel like there was lots of, like, billowy lights and... That was like Joan modern... Crawford at her most insane with that big red fright hair. Ugh. Oh my God. Oh wait, but can we talk about um, Arnold's second apartment? And it was the most 80s apartment that has ever 80s. It was ever 80s. It reminds me oh. of um, this episode of the Golden Girls where Rose moves out and she gets new roommates and she moves in this horrible, ugly, audacious <laughs> 80s apartment. Yeah. It was almost like a Charlie Sheen's apartment in Wall Street after Daryl Hannah like makes it over. It was just like all this white brick and oh, I hated it. Gold over there. The later seasons of Dynasty when they didn't have the budget, so it's just like a beautiful duvet in a blank room. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Decorator's influence was like those styrofoam cups you get at like the beach. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, very that. I feel like they based this apartment on whatever the play looked like because mm. it was like there was like three doors. It was very like Frasier almost, or like it was all there for you could have a wide shot and see the whole thing. It was weird. It's true. Lots of options for little slam doors. Yeah. Exactly. It felt like a farce apartment somehow. I think I would have liked more David stuff and a little less Ed stuff in the middle. Yeah. Brian Kerwin was kind of a stick in the mud in this movie. <laughs> I mean, at a certain point, I was just like, oh my God, Ed, you're insufferable. Like, I was just over him. Oh yeah, because we didn't talk about The weekend and Laurel. Oh my god, wait. Okay, so Ed and him have had a relationship and then they break up because he wants to be with a woman and then he's been... Are they married at this point, him and Laurel? Yes. 
I believe so. Are they? Yeah, they're they're married. Or, oh no no no! Right, it's they're a, not because then she writes him and oh, says, right. "Oh, we figured if we could get through it, then we might as well get married." It's her idea, right? She's like, yeah. "I want to see this guy," because she's the one when they break up initially, right? And he's they're trying to get into the elevator, and he's yeah. just like. Why do you sleep with men? Like, she can clearly hear that they have fucked. I need to be proud of who I am. How can sleeping with a woman make you proud of yourself if you know you'd rather be with a man? There's no you to respect. I think she must have just been like, well, I need to know before I marry this guy if he's going to fucking go cheat on me in the back room of studs or not. She got her answer. She did. Yeah. It all could have been solved had she just broke up with him. She didn't need to invite him to the ranch. Right. I did love Harvey's countryside overalls look. I was feeling that. His butch, you know, it was very like all that heaven allows. Like, and I've got my flannel and I'm ready. Didn't they have him doing farm chores in one scene? I feel like that was a scene. They were like cutting wood and he dropped it into the water. And I was like, what are you doing? You can't use that for firewood now. And he burns the pancakes. And... But then pours water on them. I didn't know why. It was very Because they were on fire. But wasn't it the stove that was on fire? There was a lot of things happening. It was an old stove. And that was kind of cute in the beginning where he takes home Ed and he like basically runs into the bathroom real quick and gets freshened up before he wakes, acts like he's waking up with it. Right, this Mrs. Maisel moment. Oh, his his like leaning with the light just perfectly. Oh, I'm asleep. Oh, yes. (laughs) That really got me. I I didn't hang a poster that said happy two week anniversary (laughs) and then go back to sleep in like (laughs) the... Oh, you remembered. Oh. Happy two week anniversary. Oh, had you remembered. Oh, because, okay, so back to when we first meet Alan. They get in that confrontation. That guy's being an asshole, and they pull the knife on him. And then Matthew Broderick faints. Yeah. Roz, put it in my dressing room. And then is catatonic for a number of hours. Right, it was like, He's put not, him in my dressing his room. His eyes are open. I'm going to continue to Finish? do a number. Then we'll bring him after we've closed up. He's still passed out. Unresponsive. But his eyes are open. His, the- I was like, oh, he's asleep? But no, his eyes are open. It's like he's catatonic or something. It probably wouldn't be a scene that flies today where you just take home a random drunk stranger who's <laughs> comatose. It definitely seemed weird. Oh, no. But I guess, like, back then you didn't have a cell phone and, like, you know, like... So maybe that was part of it? I don't know. I think he saw Matthew Broderick and said, put him in my dressing room. <laughs> it's, it's gay, so it's hot. Well, he was a perfect gentleman, and then he cooked him breakfast. He was a perfect he gentleman. Gay. <laughs> Is your voice natural, or do you have a cold? Oh, my God. so many good lines. There were so many good one-liners. You have a pretty deep voice for a lesbian, or a high voice for a lesbian, yeah. yes. <laughs> I have a high voice for a lesbian. I've used that a couple times on stage, I'm not gonna lie. I love that. Yeah, I mean, the heckling was so much. Bring on the freaks. Did your mother have any children that lived? (laughs) Thank you, darling. Or that horrible one, did your mother have any children that lived? Oh, (laughs) savage. Savage, I loved it. Oh my God, that scene where they go to the dress barn or whatever and they're trying out all the, oh, I loved it. I loved it so much. Do you have these at the 16? Oh my God, when they, the Charles Pierce line, I said that to Sasha Velour when we did our white party and she showed us her dress. It's like, great for canasta. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Fabulous for Canasta. <laughs> Wouldn't you gentlemen feel a lot more comfortable in another kind of store? That terrified poor shop woman when Matthew Broderick comes in and she's trying to keep them from going in the dressing room together. Oh my God. I feel like the only thing, as far as this movie goes, is a time capsule. The only thing, not to bring the mood down or anything, that they did not touch upon at all was the AIDS crisis. For me, at a certain point, I was just like, oh God, I'm just, like, there's so much anxiety because I'm just waiting for something horribly wrong to happen. And then he gets, you know, beat and murdered by a bunch of kids with a bat. And then it's like 1980s, and I'm like, oh, great. It's just going to get lighter from here on out. But they didn't really go there. Well, so what happened was, I was reading about it, since the play took place in the 70s, and then the movie didn't take place till the late 80s, they decided we're just going to keep it the original timeline of when the play was writing about and just skip over and just be like, we're not talking about it. Because then we have to change the whole narrative of everything. So it is there you are thinking about it, but that is kind of why they were like, you know, we're just going to... Time capsule this even more. 
I don't, maybe it's just my own wild imagination going, but the fact that in the later scenes, we never saw Charles Pierce again, that was always kind of how I imagined what maybe could have happened to his character. I mm. mean... Pretty dark. Pretty yeah. dark, but yeah. No, Harvey just cut him because he was stealing the limelight. <laughs> Night, dear. I swear that queen gives me gas. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I love that line. So when Matthew Broderick's picking him up outside the club for the first time, and he's completely ignoring Murray and Murray, hello, I am another person in the world. Yes. <laughs> hello, I'm another person in the world. Hi. <laughs> I really like that. It was really There's good. so many great lines. Yeah. And it's not done in a way that's like a punchy comedy. Like the lines just keep coming. And if you pick them up, you pick them up. That's why I think if you watch it a few times, you'll pick up even more. Whoops, is when you accidentally <laughs> fall down an elevator shaft. <laughs> Whoops is when you accidentally douche with Drano. Whoops is when you accidentally douche with Drano. This was not a whoops. This was no whoops. This was an ah. It was an ah. They were watching that weird stunt we're on fire show. What was that? I don't know. It was also weird because it started with like a house that kind of looked like the farmhouse catching oh. on fire. And so I was like, oh, what's this? Was like the house, the one, there's like a whole other, oh no, it has nothing to do with anything. I she just torched the reading. place after they broke up. <laughs> right? It's the burning bed. <sighs> one of the things that always stuck out to me was um, when they reviewed this film, the Village Voice gave it a really terrible review. And oh, they really? posted a comic book, basically like a comic strip. And it showed two obvious gay guys going either their choices were Torch Song Trilogy or Rambo 5 or 6. And they're edging towards Rambo 5. And like the caption is, who wants to go see those sissies? Like that was the attitude surrounding this film when it was released. Oh. Wow. It was weird, like so internal crazy. homophobia happening all over when they're releasing this movie. That's crazy and disappointing. Yeah, because it's so good. It really is. And I think it's so important. The conversation, again, is unfortunately still very relevant, especially like when we look at drag, right? If this is talking about the drag community, obviously the platform and everything has changed and grown so much since then. But a lot of the conversations about family are still there and still present in every season of Drag Race. It still is very fundamentally a coming of age or a, a queer relationship with oneself and parents although i loved that every speech of his was always just like well i'm fucking fabulous and if you don't think so fuck you i want to be a part of my life i'm not editing out the things you don't like there's nothing i need from anyone except for love and respect and anyone who can't give me those two things has no place in my life <laughs> it's like yes kick rocks mom yeah <laughs> i really appreciated that he was just out like he was just like look it is what it is i'm gay like i don't know what to tell you i'm not apologizing for it i'm gonna be as gay as i want i'm gonna talk about it it's who i am he was so forthcoming in so many ways with about that that i really appreciated it yeah would you say he is what he is <laughs> he's his own special creation <laughs> Are we, are we doing this right now? <laughs> should I, should we go on? <laughs> or should I start a... taking my makeup off as you say it? Yeah. <laughs> I thought you said he was Jewish. He's out of town, Jewish. <laughs> there was just line after line. It really, it's so quotable. You told me he was Jewish. Out of town, Jewish. Like, it really does beg the question, like, what would it have been like if Estelle Getty played that part? Like, she had so many similar things in Golden Girls with, like, the cross-dresser's son. Yeah. Like, she would have ate this part Ah. And, like, Jewish mother and Italian mother are so close already that, like, basically, it would have been Sophia. And Estelle Getty's big problem with being Sophia is the fact that she begged for them to make her Jewish because Estelle Getty was Jewish. <laughs> so it would have been easier for her to do. So, like, it just would have been, like, I don't know. I feel like she would have just eaten this whole role alive. Like, oh, I would have yes. died to have seen her on stage when she was doing this. Yes. And she couldn't do it because she was doing Golden Girls. Mm. They wouldn't let her out of the contract. Ugh. But although that Anne Bancroft was fucking great. Fucking great. What but a like, replacement. Do... Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I do think that they really, like you were saying about tone, like, they really do a good job of having this huge, dramatic, really upsetting fight. But then he'll throw in a bit of humor, or she will, or they'll find some common ground and make a joke with each other and smile and be like, 
it'll be okay, we're just having it out, and then go back into the fight. It, it handled that really well. David is gay. He's been here less than a year. He came that way. Nobody comes that way. What an opening. <laughs> and she says, oh, it runs in the family. And I, I thought yeah. that was a nice little thing of like, oh, well, he learned from her of how to make light of things. Well, and even that his brother is so just like cool with it. Like we barely see him, but he's just like, she just doesn't get it. Like when she has that line of like, oh, great. So you can turn him against me too, which was like a very Jewish mother thing to say, but also, <laughs> but I thought that was interesting where it was like, she knew that the brother would support him. Wait a minute. Okay. There's one more thing that Ken Page is famous for that Murray was in that I forgot about. Mm. He He's old Deuteronomy in the Cats Live <laughs> production. Oh, okay. <laughs> in what, like the original Broadway, like the first recording? The one, No, the one that you can like buy on DVD. Right. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Are we Cats fans here? Oh, no. No, no. Oh, thank God. I didn't want to get into that. Oh, my goodness. I'm like Maxwell Sheffield when it comes to cats. I'm sorry. <laughs> Rebel Wilson tearing her skin apart still will scar oh me God. forever. I screamed out loud in the my... theater. And the eating the little cockroaches. Oh, my God. With people faces on them. What? Who's? I. Uh. Terrifying. Yeah. Put a poor costumer out of work. Oh, for what? <laughs> How do you two feel about this in comparison to later gay films? Because I've seen a lot of gay movies. You know, your TLA, your Wolfie videos, your eating outs, all of it. Sure. How do you feel like this relates in the trajectory of gay film? And where would you place it? I think it's one of the most sort of like thoughtful and real and actually good gay movie portraits. Yeah. That I can think of. Like it's, it's fucking great. Like it's a Oscar movie to me. I would put it so, really high too. I always placed it sort of like at the a top tier as far as LGBT cinema goes. Like there'd be this one, Boys in the Band, and then it trickles down from there like your outrageous is to eventually your your eating out to your another gay movie's like the very bottom of the barrel. Right. I mean those are a different thing too, but yes. Entirely different genres, like one's drama, one's comedy, but like as far as like gay dramas go, this one's probably, you know, top of the line as far Absolutely. as you get. It just, it, like we said before, it just felt so true. It didn't feel like Hollywood had its fingers in it too much of like, it can't be that gay or we have to have it have a happy ending or, or whatever it is. It just didn't it feel like it rent. was messed. It yes. wasn't rent. Shooting a gay couple, like they're, he's a private investigator. Like. <laughs> it felt true and real to me. And so that's why I think I put it at a higher tier than, yes, there's a lot of trash gay movies. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think this was really one of the best written LGBT movies. I put this up there with like Priscilla. I would put Priscilla on that list yes. where it's very, oh, absolutely. very, very good. And, and it wasn't just cause so often in Hollywood movies, it's just, and then there's the gay and it wasn't that. And I'm so glad it wasn't that. <laughs> there was no Emery character, you know, like I'm gay out of my way. I'm gay. Right. Right. Everyone felt like a real person that they, someone knew in real life. The character we got that was sort of like an Emery esque would be the Charles Pierce character, like the comic relief, you know, but he was in and out so quickly. Yeah. And even his right. portrayal, like it seemed like they treated the character like he was actually existed. Yes. Yes. I was going to say, I know they recently redid this on Broadway with Michael Yuri. And this oh. is one of those movies I feel like is really primed to get remade if they ever wanted to like bring it back. Who would you want to see as Arnold or any of the people? I'm just curious. I mean, I love the idea of Michael Yuri. He's so pretty though. Yeah. Like, it doesn't... It'd be a really busted drag queen. <laughs> It'd be in the same spirit as Harvey in this movie. Oh. I'd I love to see the drag characters, like a Latrice Royale, or, you know, as Murray, or even, like, oh, Leslie yes. Jordan as Charles Pierce's character. Yes. Yes. <laughs> love that. Maybe it's, like, um, not a famous person that plays Arnold. I think you could probably pick amongst the Broadway, uh, yeah. you know, crowd... And find someone who's not as like, oh my god, big name, but who has the talent. I mean, there wasn't the really job. any singing or anything. Like, those songs really? were, like, not <laughs> real. That wasn't, like, singing. Were you there? I puke. So discreetly I don't make a sound. What are you talking about? Did you watch the movie? 
It was a, like like we said, it was like two minutes tops total of like you know. Are you saying you did not live for Harvey Firestein's rendition of "Love for Sale"? <laughs> Who's prepared to pay the price for a trip to paradise? Love for sale. It was like Tom Waits. Maybe Tom Waits plays Arnold. <laughs> oh. Stanley Tucci in the remake? I feel like Stanley Tucci should be in it. But he's too old. Somewhere, yeah. Some, not as Arnold, just somehow in it. Somehow. A kind, you know, gay assistant or something. You know, what he's usually doing in movies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Presser. <laughs> Is Andrea Martin the uh, mom? Yeah. Cool. Yes, you nailed it. Who is going to be the wife in denial? That's Ooh. a fun role. I'd Julie probably Foster. Go to like Dakota Johnson or something. Oh, sure. <laughs> I like that I just went to like a difficult people thing. It was like Julie Klossner can play the girlfriend and then we'll just cast Billy Eichner could play. I was going to say, is Billy Eichner or Arnold? Ooh. Maybe. I'm not like mad that. at that. Or like a Dan Levy type. Yeah. Ooh. Yes. We got there. We yeah. nailed oh it. God. Yeah. Why don't we work nailed for it. Hollywood? <laughs> cast it. <laughs> Wait, oh yeah, and then, yeah, oh, we just like, it's like a difficult people reunion in this remake of a movie. I love it. Exactly. Now, who's, <laughs> who plays Alan? Tom mm. Holland. Yes. Yep. Yeah, uh, yes. Tom Holland. <laughs> <laughs> Little Spider-Man? tweaky Tom Holland, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense for the role. I just always want to cast big buff men and everything, so I'm probably not good for that. You guys, you guys, you figure it out. <laughs> Tom Holland could be David, I guess. Oh, no, or he's too old going, for that. Also, Tom Holland's yeah. too smart. It has to be somebody that's kind of a dum-dum, like, and also, like, playing against type. Who's a real right. dum-dum? Like a Noah Centineo type. <laughs> maybe too dumb. Maybe too dumb. <laughs> I do like, too, that, like, the Torch song was as much for his mother's love as it was for, like, his own personal romantic love stories, you know, where it's like, we kind of end up at the end looking at him wishing that he like that unrequited love is from his own mom but that's yeah. tragic and also real and one of the many layers of this movie i thought it was really good it's great yeah <laughs> it's fucking great it should be streaming i'm mad it, i hope everybody goes and watches this movie you know find find it you can figure it out or watch our viewing party with me alone and my dog it's yeah. great it's like riff tracks but with more chips <laughs> there were chips Oh my God, who ate the chips? You ate them, didn't you? Uh-uh. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Tickle fight. <laughs> you did! Because girls love chips. Girls love chips. <laughs> More than they love dress shops. What about Molly? You like her, I'll make sure he gives her enough money. She can have a dress shop. Girls love dress shops. Tell me More something. than they hate rape. No, plush novelty. What? Plush novelty. Wait, what? Because if there's one thing rape victims love, it's bloody revenge. And plush novelties. What was that last part? I was the, the David Schmader commentary from Showgirls when he's talking about how girls love chips and dress shops. Because you after know what she's... we're talking about? I know Showgirls. Heard... Is there like audio have you commentary watched the... that I haven't heard? <gasps> you haven't watched it? No. Oh my god. Oh my gosh. We have to like send you the file or something. Yes. So this guy David Schmader became the like unauthorized official of like aficionado of Showgirls, and he would tour it around like it was uh, Mr. Science Theater, and he would talk and do like screenings or whatever. And then for the 20th anniversary, 25th anniversary, MGM called him and was like, hey, we get it. We understand what this is now. Do you want to come and record a commentary track for us? And it's so good. We have to send it to you. It's the best. It's amazing. I'm, gonna, I'm sure as soon as that happened, Peaches Christ was probably just somewhere steaming. <laughs> she wasn't Steam. called. <laughs> or no, what do you do to Peaches? I just went She's to call me pressed. by your name She's and I wasn't pressed. gonna say it out loud. She's pre- yeah, you press the peaches. There you go. Call me by your name. Oh, no. Wait, what? Andrew went to call me by your name. Oh, okay. I didn't see that. Oh, well, you didn't see I never call me saw it because that Timothy Chamberbar person makes me uncomfortable. Don't. You're fine. You're fine. But in I it, he fucks a peach. <laughs> yes, oh, okay. It's like an American Pie kind of situation. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. But much more angsty and sweaty. <laughs> so... Somehow we managed to get grapefruiting and peach fucking in this episode about <laughs> Harvey Firestein and Gage yeah. Cinema. <laughs> I mean, you know, Tell Call Me it. By Your Name, a similar dramatic 
coming of age slash, you know, queer identity right. movie with a bisexual character, unrequited love. That also ignores the AIDS crisis. It, that also ignores yeah. the AIDS crisis. Not nearly so done what as well. you're saying is Torch Sign Trilogy need more peach fucking, is what you're saying. That is, it definitely needs no, more No, no, no. <laughs> Torch Sign Trilogy does everything right that I didn't like about Call Me By Your Name. Yeah. I, yeah, it's definitely worth a gander. And if you enjoy a movie like this, definitely look up other movies like Boys in the Band, like classic, yeah. classic gay cinema. I think Outrageous is just on YouTube. It is, yes. Yes. Fully. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. Do you have anything that you want to plug and talk about? How's your quarantine life going? Oh, nothing has changed. I'm just glad we finally got a chance to catch up again. Yes. <laughs> Last time, I think we just talked about Gloria Swanson for a solid oh. hour, which was fun. I mean, I could talk about Gloria Swanson for the rest of my life. <laughs> when I was um, going to record in Garage Band, I was like, in the Gay Raj Band. Oh my God, the Gay Raj. In the Gay Raj. Nonsense. There's a room over the Gay Raj. <laughs> it's me, Haga. <laughs> Haga. Oh, we have to do another classic movie soon. Oh my god, I'm sorry I couldn't do <gasps> Gilda. I've never seen it. You have to watch That's okay. it. okay. It's so good. It's so good. I'll give it a gander. Yeah. What else do you guys got to do? It's true. You're still locked down until June, right? <laughs> yeah, we're Basically. we're just you know. Well, we have Drag Race to Drag Race to keep you occupied. Oh my god. We have Drag Race till the end of time. Till the end of time, or at least until the end of what they filmed already. That's I'm enjoying true. your circle of hell. I really am. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you get for saying that me and Kimura should have been a double elimination. Oh my God. Did we, did see we that? say that? <laughs> I don't remember that. Oh, I no. remember everything. Oh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joshing you. I don't care. <laughs> oh my gosh. That was 17 years ago. <laughs> but you guys should definitely watch Torch Song Trilogy. It's worth the gander. <laughs> yes, everyone yes, watch Torch Song Trilogy. Everybody go watch it. And subscribe to um, James's channel. God, we just hit 100K. I mean, I know it's not a 60,000 subscribers like your guys', is, but I mean. <laughs> is this some shade? Now, when do you get your little <gasps> YouTube play button? I don't know. They keep giving me the runaround. Well, if you ever want to do some sort of uh tutorial with us or puppet making or whatever you just let us know we'd be happy to come on yeah i would love to see what you would come up with <laughs> it would be weird yeah. <laughs> i like weird oh my god we, we should totally make it happen well cheers thanks for joining us thanks james and everybody go watch short song trilogy yeah bye cheers bye. 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 Bye.